My God is awesome. Come on, say he can move mountains. Keep me in the valley. Come on, say it. Happy from the rain. That's it. My God is awesome. Come on. Heals me when I'm broken. Strength where I've been weakened. Forever he'll reign. Come on, you got it. My God is awesome. Come on, say, he can move mountains. Keep me in the valley. Hide me from the rain. Has he ever covered you? Come on, my God is awesome. Heals me when I'm broken. Strength where I've been weakened. Forever he'll reign. One word. Come on, everybody. My God. My God is awesome. Come on, somebody lift your voice. Rachel Ashcraft, and I am the Alabama Occupational Therapy Association President. I'm so excited to be here with you all today to share our 2020 award recipients for the Ann Cosby Service Award, as well as the OTR Award of Excellence. First, I'll be presenting the Ann Cosby Service Award. This year's recipient embodies service and leadership. 
She currently serves as faculty at Alabama State University, where she was nominated for the Outstanding Health Sciences Faculty Member Award. She has served on the Alabama State Board of OT and as the Vice President of ALOTA. She has served in many other community organizations, including Rebuilding Together in Montgomery, the Milton Road Residents, Aid for Inmate Mothers, League Logs Co-Editor for Junior League of Montgomery, as a carpet technician and a volunteer to the American Red Cross, and as a member of Emerge Montgomery. It is my honor to award this year's Ann Cosby Service Award to Dr. Jewel Dixon. Congratulations. I'm Scotty Hollins with Blueprint Tuscaloosa, where our mission is to empower and equip students at the University of Alabama to become leaders who transform under-resourced communities right here in Tuscaloosa by investing in urban youth. Said another way, we want to take the campus to the under-resourced community. One of the programs that we have started to uh, fulfill this mission is the whole elementary mentorship program. We started back in the fall of 2017, and my goodness, did we have a blast. Uh, you get a chance to see in this video uh, the, all the fun that we had, but more importantly, you'll get a chance to hear a little bit of the impact that our student athletes were able to have in each of these kids that we invested in. We started with the fourth grade and we worked on uh, just five specific areas uh, of needed growth, being proactive versus reactive, uh, leadership, goal setting, working well with others, and respecting others. As we mentored the kids in these areas, we saw some special things happen this year. Take a look. I learned that if I want to be a YouTuber, I need to set smaller goals to reach up to it. Yeah! I said it's building block time! Yeah! I said it's building block time! Yeah! <laughs> Hey, Jamie, your new nickname? Big Fella. Big Fella. So, I know you're probably thinking, what would a day in the life of a student athlete going to Hold Elementary look like? I'm glad you asked. Uh, we would arrive around 11.30, and we would uh, make the winding path to the classroom. And uh, once we arrived in the classroom, we would be bombarded by the kids who were just happy to see us. After that, we would kind of do a time where we would share, uh, you know, each student athlete would share their name, their sport, uh, what year they were in school and where they're from, along with their favorite food uh, or their favorite uh, restaurant. And so uh, after that, we will break up into small groups, the five groups that I mentioned earlier, we break up into those groups and uh, we would separate for about uh, 30, 40 minutes and that would be our mentoring time. We would come back at the end and spend about five to 10 minutes allowing the kids to tell us what, what they learned uh, that day. That's probably the most fun part of it all. 
Um, and then after that, we would say our goodbyes, sometimes take a picture, and then we would come back and do it again the next day. About halfway through our program, Mr. Tortoris, uh, one of our fourth grade teachers, pulled me aside and wanted to share with me a story of how our student athletes were investing uh, in one of their uh, kids that had the greatest need. Listen to his story. Yeah, and just the fact that you guys have uh, talked to them about goals and got their you know, mind focused on goals. A lot of my boys who normally wouldn't step up with reading have really been pushing themselves so that they can basically brag to you guys when you come. But one particular student comes to mind, she was reading about mid second grade level when she came. She's bilingual, so she was having a little bit of trouble with uh, English, uh, but she set a goal with her very first meeting with her athletes, and after that, she just started taking books home and coming back the next day, Mr. Tortoris, I read this book. Mr. Tortoris, I read that book. I made a 100, <laughs> I made a 90. She was just killing it, and in uh, my benchmark testing, she was a uh, 2.7, which means she was reading on the seventh month of a second grade level, and when I tested her the other day, she was fourth grade, first month, so she made over a year, almost a year and a half of growth in a month and a half, and it just took that spark. You know, everything, the pieces were in place for that child, but she needed to see that somebody, you know, was invested in her, and that was enough to just get her to go out and, and push herself. In Matthew 9, 36 to 38, we see a great example of the disciples following Jesus to take the gospel uh, to the lost. Uh, in this passage, we see uh, they come upon a multitude of people. And Jesus says, as soon as he saw the multitude of people, it says he was full of compassion. Because as he, as he looked at the people, they were harassed and they were helpless like sheep without a shepherd. And so he turned to his disciples and says, listen, the harvest is plentiful. Speaking of this great multitude of people. But he turns to them and says, but the laborers are few. And he told them, here's my challenge to you. Pray to the Lord of the harvest to send more laborers into the harvest. That's pretty gripping if you think about it. That's our challenge. And that's what we're asking you to do, is will you join us in praying that the Lord will send more laborers into the harvest and that he used Blueprint to be a part of him doing that. I say it feels like a lot of time.
Greetings, everybody. This is Pastor Mike Jones of Harvest Community Church in Birmingham, Alabama, where we are a community of worshipers committed to Christ, commissioned to serve, and called to pray without ceasing. God is good all the time, and all the time God is good, and his mercy endures forever. This is a day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Before we get into the Word of God, I did want to do a couple of things. I wanted to acknowledge that it is Breast Cancer Awareness Sunday. I've got on my pink, and I did want to make note that each and every year, Harvest Community Church will recognize Breast Cancer Awareness during the month of October. We do want to celebrate all of those who uh, have struggled with the disease, those who are continuing to struggle with the disease, and we are praying for an end to breast cancer. I also wanted to acknowledge our very own Dr. Jewel Dixon. Congratulations, Dr. Jewel, on being the recipient of the Ann Cosby Service Award through the Alabama uh, Occupational uh, Therapist Association. Uh, you are just a worthy, worthy recipient of that great honor. And we have always recognized the great work that you are doing at Alabama State University, in Montgomery, through all of the associations you have, even worldwide with your work with Our Hope International. So congratulations to our very own Dr. Jewel Dixon. And last but certainly not least, I think you have noticed the last couple of Sundays, we have had a missions spot. Last week, we recognized Grace House Ministries in Fairfield and its founder, uh, Mama Lois Coleman. This week, we are, are recognizing the great work that Scotty Hollins is doing in Tuscaloosa with Blueprint Tuscaloosa. He is reaching college athletes at the University of Alabama and equipping them to minister back into the community. So we, we recognize that. God is doing some awesome things, even in the midst of the pandemic. And I want to thank you I want to thank you for being faithful with your tithes and with your offerings because we are still supporting these ministries. And in the weeks to come, you'll see other ministries that we support through your giving. So let's get right into the word of God. If you have your Bibles, open them up to Mark chapter 12, Mark chapter 12. And we're going to read verses 28 through 31, Mark chapter 12, 28 through 31. Verse 28, then one of the scribes came and having heard them reasoning together, perceiving that he had answered them well, asked him, which is the first commandment of all? Jesus answered, the first of all the commandments is, hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. And you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind and with all of your strength. This is the first commandment. And the second, like it, is this. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. There is no other commandment greater than these. Let's pray. Father God, we do love you today. We thank you today. We ask that you would open your word to us, that we might behold wondrous things out of your law. We pray, Father, that we would lift up and glorify the Lord Jesus, and that we would see him. And in seeing him, we would believe on him. And in believing on him, we would be saved. This is our prayer in Jesus' name. Won't you say amen, amen, and amen. About a month and a half ago, I was looking at my Facebook feed and I saw a friend of mine post a meme. And it simply said this, brace yourselves for another four years. I know I am. Well, he was talking about the presidential election. Of course, he was talking about Donald Trump. He got a number of shares of that particular meme, and he had 175 comments. 175 people commented on his meme that says, brace yourself for another four years. Men and women, this election is, is, is bringing up all kinds of emotions in people. People are on high alert. People are sitting on ready. People have great expectations. And I was thinking this week, what if your candidate loses? 
We're going to continue on in our series, Remembering Jesus Through the Gospel of Mark. And today's message is entitled, What If Your Candidate Loses the Election? What if your candidate does not make it? What if he's not elected? What if you're rooting for Joe Biden and he doesn't get elected? Or you're a, a Trump supporter and he doesn't get elected? What if your candidate loses? This fellow had 175 comments with him just saying, brace yourself for another four years. Men and women, I think that we as Christians need to operate differently. I know some have talked about disputing the election if they don't win. Others have said it's, it's, it's rigged and others uh, are planning on, on, on demonstrating and rioting and, and doing all kinds of things if their candidate doesn't win. But I'm mindful that as a pastor, I deal with people in disappointment all the time. Here in this office, this couch behind me, there are people who have sat that have lost loved ones. There are people who have lost jobs. There are people who have been diagnosed with very serious illnesses. There are people who have, are on the verge of divorce and they're separating from their spouse. There are people who are working through infidelity and immorality. There are people whose children have, children have gone wayward. And I find myself in the counseling session starting off with the same thing. Regardless of what happens, regardless of your situation, as a Christian, you do know that your job description has not changed. And inevitably, they'll say, Pastor Mike, what do you mean? And I'll have to remind them that our mandate as Christians is to follow the two great commandments. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Our job description hasn't changed. Hebrews chapter 13, verse 8 says, Jesus, the same yesterday, today, and forever. And you get the idea that Jesus was never shaken by his circumstances, that Jesus was never uh, out of source, as it were, by things that happened, because his mind was set on his job description, on, on his person and his work, on what he was here for. And men and women, don't allow this election to sidetrack you from your job description. And so from the next few minutes, I'd like to talk about three things that this passage teaches us about our job description. What if our candidate loses the election? These three things remain the same. These th three things will not waver. They are solid. They are things that you can hold on to regardless of situation, regardless of circumstance, regardless of outcome, regardless of disappointment, any of that. These three things are our job description. And I've just mentioned two of them. The first is a part of our job description. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Regardless of outcome of this election, you, we are to love the Lord our God with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength. It's the oldest commandment even before Moses. Adam and Eve were to love God. Adam and Eve were to have a relationship with God. Adam and Eve were to, to follow God and be in loving relationship with, with him. But it's also a priority. If you were to look at the Ten Commandments, the first four commandments deal with our love for God. The last six deal with our love for our fellow man. You shall uh, uh, have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself a graven image. You shall not take the name of the Lord in vain. And you shall remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. All of those are commandments dealing with our relationship with God. Your job description hadn't changed. We've got to love God. We've got to love him with all our heart and with all our soul and with all our mind and with all our strength. Every part of us needs to love God. But point number two is simply this. He says, and the second is likened unto it. You shall love your neighbor as you do yourself. Well, how do you love your neighbor? Let's look at the Ten Commandments. Commandment number five is to, for us to honor our father and our mother. 
to respect the authority that God has placed in our lives, to honor an individual's position, to give them respect. That's how you love them. And then commandment number six is that we are not to murder. Don't kill people. Jesus would say this, when you say raka or against your brother, when there is with uncontrollable anger is sinning against your neighbor. So we respect those in authority. We, we are to not commit murder. We are to not commit adultery, no sexual sin, no defrauding one another based on sex and, and not uh, 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 sinning in that area of our lives. And sometimes we can defraud our brother, defraud our sister in the area of our sexuality. I'll keep it right there. But he goes on to say, thou shalt not steal. Don't take your, your neighbor's possessions. Don't steal. Don't, don't, don't steal. I'll leave it right there. And then he goes on to say, don't bear false witness against your neighbor. No bad language. No uh, telling lies. None of that kind of thing against your neighbor. That is a way to show them love. And then lastly, don't covet what your neighbor has. So Jesus was simply summarizing the Ten Commandments when he said, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And the second great commandment is likened unto it, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. It was a scribe that asked Jesus this question. It was a scribe who really had bad motives, probably wanted to trick Jesus and see if Jesus would, would put one commandment of Moses over another but what Jesus did was he summarized them, love God and then love people. One of the ways we can love our neighbor is simply just to love them anyway, to love them anyway. Mother Teresa put it this way, love them anyway. People are unreasonable, illogical and self-centered. Love them anyway. If you're kind, people may accuse you of selfish ulterior motives. Be kind anyway. If you're successful, you'll win some false friends and true enemies. Succeed anyway. The good you do today will be forgotten tomorrow. Be good anyway. Honesty and frankness will make you vulnerable. Be honest and frank anyway. What you spend years building may be destroyed overnight. Build anyway. People need help but may attack you if you try and help Help them. Help them anyway. In the final analysis, it's between you and God. It was never between you and them anyway. Mother Teresa had it right. We're to love people. We're to love our neighbor. We're to love them even if they are unlovable. We're to love them even if we lose our patience with them. We're to love them even if they've hurt us, even if they've offended us. We're to love people. That is our mandate. And our job description hasn't changed. We're to love folk. I know that the Elder Bill's favorite passage of scripture is 1 Corinthians chapter 13. It says, though I speak with the tongue of men and of angels, but have not love, I've become a sounding brass or a clanging cymbal. And though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and though I have all faith so that I could move, remove mountains, but have not love, I'm nothing. And though I bestow all my goods to the poor, and though I give my body to be burned, but have not love, it profits me nothing. Love suffers long and is kind. Love does not envy. Love does not parade itself. Love is not puffed up. Love does not behave rudely. It does not seek its own. It's not provoked. It thinks no evil. It does not rejoice in iniquity, but rejoices in truth. Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never fails. And that's the kind of love that God wants us to have for our neighbor. That's the kind of love Jesus is saying we're to have. Our job description has not changed. I know that one of the things I like to do is to pray the prayer of St. Francis of Assisi in my own life. Because sometimes it's hard. Sometimes I get wounded and worn. And here's the prayer. Lord, make me an instrument of thy peace. Where there is hatred, let me sow love. Where there is injury, pardon. Where there is error, the truth. Where there is doubt, the faith. Where there is despair, hope. 
where there is darkness, light, where there is sadness, joy. O divine master, grant that I might not, I might not so much seek to be consoled as to console, to be understood as to understand, to be loved as to love, for it's in the giving that we receive, it's in the pardoning that we are pardoned, it's in the dying that we are born to eternal life. Men and women, sometimes I got to pray to love people. And I'm, I'm challenging you that regardless of whether or not your candidate wins or loses next week, your job description has not changed. We're to love God with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength, and we're to love our neighbor as ourselves. And point number three is we have to love ourselves. We have got to love ourselves. And men and women, that is not a foreign concept. It's almost as if in the text, loving ourselves is a given. Notice what Matthew chapter 10 verse 31 says as Jesus talks about how our heavenly father even thinks about the sparrows, the little birds. He even knows when they fall. And Mark, Matthew chapter 10 verse 31 says, do not fear, therefore, you're more of more value than many sparrows. Now, if God values us that way, we ought to value ourselves. Now, not an unhealthy self-love where you're selfish, but a real recognition of your value and your self-worth, that you are fearfully and wonderfully made. Notice what it says here. Although the Bible does not include a specific command to love yourself, the command to love your neighbor as yourself indicates that a reasonable degree of self-love and self-respect is normal and beneficial. Jesus showed a reasonable love for himself by taking time to rest, taking time to eat, and taking time to enjoy his association with his followers and his disciples. Many women, if Jesus loved himself, we ought to love ourselves as well. We ought to look in the mirror and smile. We ought to be pleased about our uniquenesses and our, our strengths and our weaknesses, our shortcomings and those things that we do well. Because we are fearfully and we are wonderfully made. We are unique. We are one of a kind. Jesus broke the mold when he created us. And so God says that your, your job description has not changed. Love God, love your neighbor, and love yourself. I know we used to, to take kids all the time to kids across America, and they would talk about the I Am Third Award. Jesus, others, and then you. And it's such a proper order. It's a, such a proper order of things. And I believe that the thing that kept Jesus intact, the thing that caused him not to be shaken by the things that were around him, not by his circumstance or his situation, is that he remembered his job description. Jesus Christ, the same yesterday, today, and forever. His job description, the reason why he came, he never veered from that. In Mark chapter 10, verse 45, it says, Jesus says, the son of man did not come to be served but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. He came to serve. Luke chapter 19, verse 10 says that the son of man uh, came to seek and to save that which was lost. He came to serve. He came to seek and to save that which was lost. And then thirdly, in John chapter 10, verse 10, he says the thief comes only to steal, kill, and destroy. But I came that you might have life and might have it more abundantly. You see, he came to serve, he came to seek and to save that which was lost, but he also came to give us life and to give us life more abundantly. So he never veered from his job description. He never veered for why he came and what he was called to. And men and women, regardless of what happens next week, we have got to remember our job description. Presidents come and go. This happens every four years, in some cases every eight years, if they get reelected. But make no mistake, God is on his throne and he stays on the throne. There is never a new election. He has established his throne in the heavens and his sovereignty rules over all. Jesus Christ, the same yesterday, today, and forever. And men and women, we need to be like Jesus. 
we need to make sure that our job description it 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 it, it, it is a a foundation for us it is a stabilizing factor for us it is security for us our job description keeps us sane our job description gives us vision and so we're to love god we're to love our neighbor and we're to love ourselves with regard to that, I want to remind you that we are citizens of heaven. This is not our home. This is not our eternal residence. This is not, this is a temporal situation. This is a temporal election. And Jesus wants us to keep our eyes on the eternal, to make sure that we're focused on the eternal. Yes, we're to do all that we can to make a difference here. Yes, there are serious issues at hand. But what if your candidate loses the election? Your job description hasn't changed. The uh, Apostle Paul, in writing to Timothy in 1 Timothy 15, he says this, It's a trustworthy statement, worthy of full acceptance, that Jesus Christ came into the world to save sinners, of whom I'm chief. Jesus' job description was to come into the world to save sinners. Men and women, what's our job description? Our job description hadn't changed. So next week, if things don't go our way, if things go the other way, if your candidate loses the election, remember your job description. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you so much for your word today. We ask that your word would work in our lives. We pray, Father, that we would put Jesus first. And Lord God, if there is someone under the sound of my voice that has never received Jesus as Savior and Lord, they can simply pray, Lord Jesus, I need you. Thank you for dying on the cross for my sins. I open the door of my life and I receive you as my Savior and my Lord. Thank you for forgiving my sins and giving me eternal life. Take control of the throne of my life and make me the kind of person you want me to be. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, until next week, remember Jesus. He's still on the throne. And remember, regardless of what happens, remember your job description. Love God, love people, and love yourself. In Jesus' name, amen. We are hard